Welcome to Virgo Potens. I invite you to give this video a like and to subscribe to my channel. YouTube has introduced a great feature called Super Thanks. If you enjoy this video, you can support my work or say thank you by clicking on the Super Thanks icon. It's similar to offering support through a Super Chat. Prophecies and Revelations by St. Bridget of Sweden the Lord's words in the presence of the bride concerning his own majesty, and a wonderful parable comparing Christ to David, while Jews, bad Christians, and pagans are compared to David's three sons, and about how the church subsists in the seven sacraments. Chapter 5 I am God, not made of stone or wood, nor created by another but the Creator of the universe, abiding without beginning or end. I am He who came into the Virgin, and was with the Virgin without losing my divinity. Through my human nature I was in the Virgin, while still retaining my divine nature. And I am that same person who, through my divine nature, continued to rule over heaven and earth together with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Through my spirit I set the virgin on fire, not in the sense that the spirit that set her on fire was something separate from me, but the spirit that set her on fire was the same one who was in the Father and in me, the Son, just as the Father and the Son were in him, these three being one God, not three gods. I am like King David, who had three sons. One of them was called Absalom and he sought the life of his father. The second, Adonijah, sought his father's kingdom. The third son, Solomon, obtained the kingdom. The first son denotes the Jews. They are the people who sought my life and death and scorned my counsel. Consequently, now that their requital is known, I can say what David said upon the death of his son. My son, Absalom, that is, O oh, my Jewish children, where is your longing and expectation now? O oh, my children, what will be your end now? I felt compassion for you, because you longed for me to come, for me whom you learned from many signs had come, and because you longed for quickly fading glory, all of which now has faded. But I feel greater compassion for you now, like David repeating those first words over and over, because I see that you will end in a wretched death. Therefore, again like David, I say with all my love, My son, who will let me die in your steed? David knew well that he could not bring back his dead son by dying himself, but in order to show his deep fatherly affection and the eager yearning of his will, even though he knew it was impossible, he was prepared to die in the place of his son. In the same way, I now say, O oh, my Jewish children, although you had ill will toward me, and did as much as you could against me, if it were possible, and if my father allowed it, I would willingly die once again for you, for I take pity on the misery you have brought upon yourselves as required by justice. I told you what was to be done by my words, and showed you by my example. I went ahead of you like a hen, protecting you with wings of love. But you spurned it all. Therefore, all the things that you longed for have fled away. Your end is misery, and all your labor wasted. Bad Christians are denoted by David's second son, who sinned against his father in his old age. He reasoned with himself in this way. My father is an old man and failing in strength. If I say anything wrong to him, he does not respond. If I do anything against him, he does not avenge himself. If I assail him, he endures it patiently. 
Therefore, I will do what I want. With some of his father David's servants, he went up to a grove of a few trees in order to play the king. But when the wisdom and intention of his father became evident, he changed his plan, and those who were with him fell into discredit. This is what Christians are doing to me now. They think to themselves God's signs and decisions are not as manifest now as they were before. We can say what we like, since he is merciful and pays no attention. Let us do as we please, since he gives way easily. They have no faith in my power, as if I were weaker now in accomplishing my will than I was before. They imagine my love to be less, as if I am no longer as willing to have mercy on them as on their fathers. They also think that my judgment is a thing to be laughed at, and that my justice is meaningless. Therefore, they, too, go up to a grove with some of David's servants, in order to play the king with presumption. What does this grove of few trees denote? If not the holy church subsisting through the seven sacraments, as through just a few trees. They enter into this church along with some of David's servants, that is, with a few good works, in order to gain God's kingdom with presumption. They do a modest number of good works, confident that thereby, no matter what state of sin they are in, or whatever sins they have committed, they can still gain the kingdom of heaven as if it were a hereditary right. David's son wanted to obtain the kingdom against David's will, but was driven away in disgrace, inasmuch as both he and his ambition were unjust, and the kingdom was given to a better and wiser man. In the same way, these people will also be driven away from my kingdom. It will be given to those who do the will of David, since only a person who has charity can obtain my kingdom. Only a person who is pure and is led by my heart can approach me who am the most pure of all. Solomon was the third son of David. He represents the pagans. When Bathsheba heard that someone other than Solomon, whom David had promised would be king after him, had been elected by certain persons, she went to David and said, My lord, you swore to me that Solomon would be king after you. Now, however, someone else has been elected. If this is the case and it goes on in this way, I will end up being sentenced to the fire as an adulteress and my son will be regarded as illegitimate. When David heard this, he stood up and said, I swear to God that Solomon will sit on my throne and be king after me. He then ordered his servants to set Solomon on the throne and proclaim him as king, the man of David's choice. They carried out the orders of their lord and raised up Solomon to great power. And all those who had given their vote to his brother were scattered and reduced to servitude. This Bathsheba, who would have been accounted an adulteress had another king been elected, stands for nothing other than the faith of the pagans. No kind of adultery is worse than selling oneself into prostitution away from God and from the true faith, and believing in a God other than the Creator of the universe. Just as Bathsheba did, some of the Gentiles come to me with humble and contrite hearts, saying, Lord, you promised that in the future we would be Christians. Carry out your promise. If another king... If another faith other than yours should gain the ascendancy over us, if you remove yourself from us, we will burn in misery and die like an adulteress who has taken an adulterer instead of a lawful husband. Besides, although you live forever, nevertheless you will die to us and we to you, in the sense that you will remove your grace from our hearts and we will set ourselves up against you, due to our lack of faith. Therefore, fulfill your promise and strengthen our weakness and enlighten our darkness. If you delay, if you remove yourself from us, we will perish.
Having heard this, I will stand up like David through my grace and mercy. I swear by my divine nature, which is joined to my humanity, and by my human nature, which is in my spirit, and by my spirit, which is in my divine and human natures, that these three things, being not three gods, but one God, that I will fulfill my promise. I will send my friends to bring my son Solomon, that is, the pagans, into the grove, that is, into the church, which subsists through the seven sacraments as through seven trees, namely, baptism, penance, the anointment of confirmation, the sacrament of the altar, and of the priesthood, matrimony, and extreme unction. They will take their rest upon my throne, that is, in the true faith of the Holy Church. Moreover, the bad Christians will become their servants. The former will find their joy in an everlasting heritage and in the sweet nourishment that I will prepare for them. The latter, however, will groan in the misery that will begin for them in the present and last for ever. And so, since it is still the time for vigilance, may my friends not fall asleep, may they not grow weary, for a glorious reward awaits their toil. The son's words in the presence of the bride concerning a king standing on a battlefield with friends to his right and enemies to his left, and about how the king represents Christ who has Christians to the right and pagans to the left, and about how the Christians are rejected and he sends his preachers to the pagans. Chapter 6 The son said, I am like a king standing in a battlefield with friends standing to his right and enemies to his left. The voice of someone shouting came to those who stood on the right where everyone was well armed. Their helmets were fastened and their faces were turned to their lord. The voice shouted to them, Turn to me and trust me. I have gold to give you. When they heard this, they turned toward him. The voice spoke a second time to those who had turned around. If you want to see the gold, unfasten your helmets, and if you want to keep it, I will fasten your helmets on again as I wish. When they assented, he fastened their helmets on back to front. The result was that the front part with the apertures to see through was at the back of their heads, while the helmet's back part covered their eyes so that they were unable to see. Shouting like this, he led them after him like blind men. When this had been done, some of the king's friends reported to their lord that his enemies had tricked his men. He said to his friends, Go out among them and cry out, Unfasten your helmets and see how you have been deceived. Turn back to me, and I will welcome you in peace. They did not want to listen, but regarded it as mockery. The servants heard this and reported it to their lord. He said, Well then, since they have scorned me, go quickly and toward the left-hand side and tell those who stand on the left these three things. The way that leads you to life has been prepared for you. The gate is open, and the Lord himself wants to come to meet you with peace. Believe therefore firmly that the way has been prepared. Have a steadfast hope that the gate is open, and his words are true. Go to meet the Lord with love, and he will welcome you with love and peace, and lead you to everlasting peace. When they heard the messenger's words, they believed in them and were welcomed in peace. I am that king. I had Christians to my right, since I had prepared an eternal reward for them. Their helmets were fastened, and their faces were turned toward me so long as they wholly intended to do my will, to obey my commandments, and so long as all their desire aimed at heaven. By and by the devil's voice, that is, pride, 
sounded in the world and showed them worldly riches and carnal pleasure. They turned toward it by yielding their assent and desires to pride. Because of pride, they took off their helmets by putting their desires into effect and preferring temporal to spiritual goods. Now that they have put aside the helmets of God's will and the weapons of virtue, pride has got such a hold of them and so bound them to itself that they are only too happy to go on sinning right to the end and would be glad to live forever, provided they could sin forever. Pride has so blinded them that the apertures of the helmets through which they should be able to see are at the back of their heads, and in front of them is darkness. What do these apertures in the helmets represent if not the consideration of the future and the provident circumspection of present realities? Through the first aperture, they should see the delight of future rewards and the horrors of future punishments, as well as the awful sentence of God. Through the second aperture, they should see God's commandments and prohibitions, also how much they have transgressed God's commandments, and how they should improve. But these apertures are at the back of the head, where nothing can be seen, which means that the consideration of heavenly realities has fallen into disregard. Their love for God has grown cold. While their love for the world is considered with delight and embraced in such a way that it leads them like a well-oiled wheel whither it will. However, seeing me dishonored and souls falling away and the devil gaining control, my friends cry out daily to me in their prayers for them. Their prayers have reached heaven and come to my hearing. Moved by their prayers, I have daily sent my preachers to these people and shown them signs, and increased my graces to them. But, in their scorn for it all, they have piled sin upon sin. Therefore, I shall now say to my servants, and I shall put my words most assuredly into effect, My servants, go to the left-hand side, that is, to the pagans, and say, The Lord of heaven and the Creator of the universe would have the following said to you. The way of heaven is open to you. Have the will to enter it with a firm faith. The gate of heaven stands open for you. Hope firmly, and you will enter through it. The King of heaven and the Lord of angels will personally come out to meet you and give you everlasting peace and blessing. Go out to meet him and receive him with the faith he has revealed to you and that has made ready the way to heaven. Receive him with the hope by which you hope, for he himself has the intention of giving you the kingdom. Love him with your whole heart and put your love into practice and you will enter through the gates of God from which those Christians were thrust away who did not want to enter them and who made themselves unworthy by their own deeds. By my truth I declare to you that I will put my words into practice and will not forget them. I will receive you as my children, and I will be your father, I whom Christians have held in scornful scorn. You then, my friends, who are in the world, go forth without fear and shout out loud, Announce my will to them, and help them to carry it out. I will be in your hearts and in your words. I will be your guide in life and your savior in death. I will not abandon you. Go forth boldly. The more the toil, the greater the glory. I can do all things in a single instant and with a single word but I want your reward to grow through your own efforts and my glory to grow through your bravery. Do not be surprised at what I say. If the wisest man in the world could count up how many souls fall into hell each day, they would outnumber the sands of the sea or the pebbles of the shore. 
This is a matter of justice, because these souls have separated themselves from their Lord and God. I am saying this so that the devil's numbers may decrease and the danger become known, and my army may be filled up. If only they would listen and come to their senses. Welcome to the Virgo Potens YouTube channel. If you enjoy this video, give it a like. I also invite you to subscribe to this channel so that you won't miss new content. Please prayerfully consider supporting my work by becoming a patron of Virgo Potens on Patreon and or by buying one of my books. My ebooks are available on Amazon as well as on the Apple Bookstore. For those who prefer a physical copy rather than an ebook, my book, Spiritual Warfare, Know Thy Enemy, is also available as a paperback on Amazon. If you are interested in making a one-time contribution, I suggest that you do so by simply buying one of my books. I am thankful for your support. Links to Patreon and to my books will be posted in the comments section of this video. The continuation of this work isn't possible without you. Lastly, and most importantly, please pray for me. May the Virgin Most Powerful guide and protect you.